aficionado of visual effects from, from my fan days, even before I became a practitioner filmmaker. I was always trying to stay abreast of what was being done in visual effects. Star Wars uh, and motion control had really pretty much revolutionized visual effects. But then during the 80s, you saw CG really, really start to develop, but it was always kind of a niche thing that was used for, uh, for certain types of animation that could be done any other way, and it hadn't ever been integrated into the mainstream of feature production. A lot of stuff in the up till then was only partially successful, or very small number of shots or whatever. When I started at Van Island, the, what the computer graphics department was being used for was for the stylized, non realistic things. We were still a long way from, from CG becoming an important player at that point. The company needed something to gravity around, and that we could sort of prove the technology is either going to go somewhere or we didn't. Well, as we began to work with the computer graphics, it became apparent that you know, almost anything that you wanted to do with it, there was a way to do it if you put enough time and effort into it. There were kind of clues that work, and there were plenty of people to say it wouldn't. And whenever that happens, I found that to be a sign of something. We were in uncharted territory now, making up history as we went along. When I wrote the sequence of the pseudopod in the abyss, I just saw what it should look like in my head, and I would, I would do whatever was necessary to, to make that happen. We explored a lot of different ways of, of doing it, and we kept coming back to, to, to uh, computer graphics animation as the, as the uh, most likely solution, but in a sense the scariest one. Well, the big break for us on the test was having a filmmaker who was willing to take you know, a sort of substantial sequence and trust that, okay, we're going to do computer graphics for this. We try a kind of relatively new technique that uh, no one really tried to use in this way before. They had been, been doing enough R&D that they were ready to make the leap. They were ready to, to integrate a character in, in that way. And so they, they showed us some proof of concept and uh, we were off to the races. We were doing a film at the Abyss that, that, uh, that was highly realistic in terms of the, of the research and the production design, the sets, the actors. I mean, we certainly didn't pull any punches in terms of the attempt to do dramatic reality. So integrating the computer graphics effect into that was pretty scary because it had to look real. And not only had to look real, it had to look stunning. It had to look mind blowing. So the bar was set very high. Jim's one of the rare people uh, to be able to you know, work the script and direct the script around the available technology and to be able to sort of see the next step and, and take a chance on it. It's always a risk taker. And it must be something who would understand that it's going to be hard to do. I recall it being sort of 10 or 12 months of hell uh, getting, getting these shots done. And it was, it was like 20 because the render times were so immensely long. Our entire computer graphics department had 900 megabytes of online storage. That was it. And we had the entire show so much had to be learned about refractive ray tracing and, and surface reflections and how you animate and how you take the facial data uh, for, from the actors, which, were, which was done by, uh, by laser scan, and how you animate that, and how much of it is keyframe animation, and how much of it we actually had the actors do themselves. So it was quite a bit involved in it. John Miller came along with Photoshop, mm -hmm. and it hadn't, wasn't quite out there. It was First feature film for Photoshop was used on. And I spent a bunch of time in uh, this very early version of Photoshop, pasting all these things together, making these nice, the seamless reflection of elements. It was just a, uh, a kind of dynamic convergence of, of elements, and so it just seemed like it, it, it fell into place at that point. We proved we could do 16 shots in five months, whatever the thing was, on budget, pretty close. That was unheard of to be able to do something like that. And it was an image that, that you could tell just by looking at it that that couldn't have been done with stop motion, it could have been done with it. You're seeing something new, and it was something you were very excited. 900 megabytes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, to put that in perspective, on Avatar, we had a petabyte of storage, at the, just at the visual effects company alone. And they had 10,000 quad processing machines to generate the images, you know, for Avatar. But one of the things that, that, that's not different is, is this idea of being ahead of the wave of technology. Don't wait for the technology. You wait for the technology, it's like a surfer. If you wait for the wave too long, you're going to fall down the backside. But if you can come up with the ideas and be ahead of that wave of technology and utilize those, you're going to go for a very long, 
and very successful ride. So use your imaginations to figure out what will the best e-learning experience be. Then surround yourself like Jim did, with John Noll and Dennis Muir and others, with people who will go out there and find or even create the innovations that will make your dream, your vision, possible. That's the only way it will really work. And without the innovations that Jim created on the abyss, T2 would not have been possible. Without T2, Jurassic Park would not have been possible. And even War of the Wings would not have been possible. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were making Titanic, we knew about Avatar. And we knew that for Avatar to be possible, we would have to take what you saw as motion capture and push it to a whole new level. That's what we tried to do in 2005. We looked at the landscape of the entertainment industry. And we saw what was going on. And I went to Jim. And I said, Jim, I think we're at a point where we can be the impetus to push the technology to finally make Avatar. Jim wrote Avatar in 1996. The technology did not exist to do it at that time. Now, when I say that, people get confused. They think I'm talking about 3D. I'm not. I'll come back to 3D. I was talking about the technology that enabled us to use computer-generated images to create characters that would be engaging and emotive. Movies are about the close-up. And that's what we needed to do. Now, we knew we could not go to Pandora. We knew we could not even physically build Pandora. So we created what we call virtual production. And in many ways, that's what you, many of you do with the products you create. But we created virtual production in a way that it was director-centric. In a way where, where Jim Cameron would go into a motion capture volume, like you saw, but we wanted to change motion capture. We felt that motion capture was missing one very key letter in front of it, an E, for e-motion capture. So we changed the whole paradigm, and we started calling it performance capture, and not just motion capture. And we had a big volumes, it was 70 by 40, that our actors went into. And we didn't just capture their body performances, we captured their facial performances as well. And we put Jim into that volume. And we put a camera in Jim Cameron's hands. Because we wanted him to be able to work with the actors with the same intimacy that he worked with Kate and Leo or anybody in the past. And when he picked up this virtual camera, and it was in a, a barren room, and he moved the camera around, he didn't see the barren room. He saw the virtual world of Pandora. And he could work with the actors and create his shots in the moment. Let me show you a clip of the behind the scenes of Avatar in this process. Can we run the next clip, please? 